it's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer X35. This is a monitor from the Predator lineup of gaming monitors and it features a 3440 by 1440 VA panel with a 35 inch screen size 21 by 9 aspect ratio and support for a 200Hz refresh rate. As usual this video accompanies a detailed written review and you can find a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. As usual for video, what you see depends on my camera, it depends on the editing done by my video editing software, it depends on YouTube, and ultimately it depends on the screen you're actually looking at the video on. So in no way does it represent exactly what this screen would look like first hand. The 3440 by 1440 resolution and the 21 by 9 aspect ratio, this is something which is explored in a couple of articles on our website. One of them specifically looks at the 3440 by 1440 resolution on a screen of this kind of size, 34 inches, 35 inches, and the other article looks more generally at 21 by 9. But this aspect ratio is something I'm very comfortable with. I've used quite a few ultra wide monitors like this before. I really do like this aspect ratio. For productivity purposes, it's good. For working, um, you can browse the internet or have one application open and another side by side and you get a good amount of desktop real estate spread across the screen. You also have a decent clarity to the image and a decent detail level, a de decent fairly crisp look to text and that's because the pixel density is quite high. It's similar to a 27 inch 2560 by 1440 or WQHD model. I mean, it is essentially the same height as a 27 inch 16 by 9 monitor. It just has extra width and extra pixels uh, to the side, so you get more space. Something I quite like to do when I'm sort of multitasking or procrastinating more to the point, I might have a website open sort of in, in a third of the screen there. So that's still enough space to actually read the text and interact with the content. And I'd have the rest of the screen perhaps showing a movie or something like that. Now, I don't tend to watch my own videos on YouTube. I'm just using this as an example, and obviously there aren't going to be any copyright issues because I created the content. I'm running in the cinema mode on YouTube. There's still a bit of a black border. You can get rid of that black border, optimize the screen space. Then you've got sort of, it's not really half and half, but you get sort of most of the screen occupied by a video, and that's quite immersive, but you get a little bit of space to work with your internet content as well. And that was just an example. I mean, you can have your windows arranged however you like, whatever works for you. I'd also mention that for movie content, I'm not going to show this, and that's because of copyright issues, basically. Um, people are really very strict about that kind of thing now. I'm not going to show any movie content running on 21 by 9 but you can get browser extensions on Google Chrome, and I believe Firefox as well, and they will make sure that, where possible, the content actually fills up a lot of the screen, so you get the whole screen space occupied by the content, it sort of zooms and crops, so to speak. And you can read more about that in the articles which I've mentioned on the 3440 by 1440 experience, for example. And if you refer to the written review, there's a little section all about the 3440 by 1440 experience there, and a bit more on the movies. I will show you some gameplay. Um, naturally, a lot of my content is focused on gameplay and the experience there. So you will get to see some games with the 3440 by 1440, 21 by 9. The screen is also curved. It has a 1800R curve, so it's a moderate curvature. In videos and when you look at photos of the monitor, it tends to exaggerate this curve and it sort of makes it look almost kind of pin cushioned. You can, you can see that on this video, it sort of looks like it's squished in in the middle. When you're actually looking at it um, with your eyes, you don't actually get this effect at all to the same extent. And I find the curve perfectly natural and I actually quite like the curve. I find it perfectly comfortable to use. Some people would say that viewing comfort is enhanced by the curve and there's some research to suggest that. You can read about that in our viewing comfort article if you want. But basically it just makes it slightly more immersive. It kind of brings the content into your field of view a bit better and it's just quite nice. It just works nicely on a screen of this sort of width, an ultra wide screen in my opinion. You'll see when I talk about the external features of the monitor shortly and I sort of move the camera around, you can see the curve exaggerated a bit there as well. But again, when you're just sitting in front of the monitor using it normally, it's really just a subtle thing. It's not something I'd worry about. 
Naturally, if you're a designer and you like geometric perfection and that kind of thing, then yes, a flat monitor may well make more sense. But for most users, I really wouldn't worry about the curve. In fact, I would embrace the curve. I also mentioned a key feature of the monitor. In my opinion, this is something that's very important. Screen surface it uses a light matte anti-glare screen surface. So it has quite a smooth look to the image. There isn't obvious graininess. And it also preserves the clarity and vibrancy potential better than stronger matte screen surfaces. So I'm pretty happy with the screen surface used here. Just a few extra things to talk about before sort of moving on in the review. And one of them is that the monitor does have an active cooling solution. It has a cooling fan. I haven't exactly counted how many fans there are. Um, it's at least one, I'll tell you that much. And I know this kind of thing can put some users off. The fact that the monitor makes noise um, and has a fan. I personally don't have a problem with it. I do actually notice it on this model, even when I'm just on the desktop, like at the moment. Every now and then, um, quite frequently actually, the monitor's fan will spool up and it's a slightly higher pitch than my system fans. So if I've got my ear out, I can actually hear that above my system fans. As I describe in the written review, it's kind of like listening to a hairdryer in the distance. It's got that kind of quality to it. But when I'm listening to my content and my games or whatever, I've got my headphones on or I'm listening to sound through speakers, I don't notice this. I don't have complaints from others sitting behind me in the room either. So it's not something I would consider particularly obnoxious and I wouldn't let it put you off, but do be aware it is there. And I know some people have silent systems and they just don't like the monitor to make noises. I completely get that. So this could be potentially annoying for those users. Another thing to slot in here, because it doesn't really fit in elsewhere in the review, is the color signal. On the, on the 27 inch 4K models, so the Acer X27 and ASUS PG27UQ, you had to use something called chroma subsampling as a method to save bandwidth and compress the signal. On this monitor, you don't have to use that. Um, in fact, I, I wouldn't use that just generally. There's, there's no reason to. Now you can see I've got it running at 200 Hertz and that's using the factory overclock in the OSD and that's explored in the OSD video, that little feature, but it's very easy to unlock the 200 Hertz refresh rate. And when you're running this, or indeed if you're running 180 Hertz or anything beyond 144 Hertz, you'll notice that the output color depth option is grayed out and it's set to eight bits per channel. If you set the monitor to 144 Hertz, you'll see that this isn't grayed out and you can actually change that to 10 bits per channel. For most users and most users, this really isn't an issue, just having it at eight bits per channel because the vast majority of content will only use eight bits per channel. That includes games under SDR. It includes just when you're browsing the internet, you sort of editing Word documents, whatever you might be doing, unless you specifically have a workflow which uses 10 bits per channel precision, there's no need to have this feature unlocked or activated. It's not gonna do anything for you. So generally don't be put off using 200 Hertz, but if you do want this kind of extra precision, lower the refresh rate. Um, and, and for the desktop, 144 Hertz is really quite a high refresh rate anyway. It feels quite nice uh, just on the desktop anyway. 120 Hertz, you'll now notice there's 12 bits per channel and that's even more rare than 10 bits per channel. It doesn't really have any use that I'm actually aware of specifically. I think you'd be a very niche uh, usage pattern for this to be useful. Uh, so again, really don't worry about it. But if you know you have to use 12 bits per channel, by all means use 120 Hertz or a lower refresh rate. If you're running the monitor under HDR, and I'm just gonna switch on HDR now, then things change a bit. And the reason they change a bit is not because the options here are any different, they're exactly the same. So if I put it on 200 Hertz, it'll again be locked into eight bits per channel. There we go. It isn't grayed out, but you can only select eight bits per channel. HDR does actually use 10 bits um, per channel and it's used in the content itself and it's used in the pipeline. But all it means is if you're at 200 Hertz or 180 Hertz, 
and the monitor is only using 8 bits per channel, it doesn't mean that 10 bits per channel isn't used in the pipeline. It just means that the dithering process, because this monitor always uses dithering beyond 8 bits, it's 8 bits native, so to speak, then anything extra is dithering. Now, this dithering can be offloaded to the GPU. So if I go on Advanced Display Settings, you'll be able to see here it says 8 bits with dithering. What that means is the monitor itself is doing its 8-bit thing, but the dithering is actually on the GPU side rather than the monitor side. Now, I very carefully looked at a range of content, not just on this monitor, but on others, comparing sort of the monitor handling the dithering versus the GPU handling the dithering under HDR. And honestly, I just can't see a difference. I'm not saying them, I mean, I haven't really done side-by-side -side comparisons because I only have one unit when I'm testing them. Um, so I'm not saying there aren't any differences at all and perhaps in some specific examples or perhaps in future content you might be able to see some differences but really I have a very keen eye for this kind of thing and I specifically looked at gradients and um, sort of weather effects that kind of thing fog smoke things that would usually show off differences here and sort of subtle differences between different shades and honestly it does a very good job when you just having the GPU handling the dithering as well. So the moral of the story is, don't worry about it, HDR or SDR, just choose whatever refresh rate you're comfortable with. I do completely get though that some people might want the monitor to be handling as much of this as possible and the bit depth to be as high as possible. So by all means, choose a lower refresh rate if it makes you feel better. And also be aware that unless you're actually getting above 144 frames a second, there's no reason to select 180 hertz or 200 hertz anyway. To show you, I've now got it at 144 hertz. If you select use default color settings, it'll actually, if you're, if you're running HDR, it will be using 10 bits per channel on the monitor if that's what it's supported because you're using an appropriate refresh rate. So if I now go back onto the advanced display settings, see it just says bit depth 10 bit there's no mention of dithering that isn't because dithering isn't used on the monitor it is because the GPU is not handling the dithering everything is on the monitor so it's 8 bit plus 2 bit dithering on the monitor side so if you go onto the main menu and then select the little I thing there which is a second button down you'll see it says format 10 bits per channel RGB 444 BT 2020 don't worry too much about all of that but it will just confirm that it is using 10 bits per channel or whatever bit depth is appropriate for the refresh rate you're using. And again, that's just what the monitor's doing. It doesn't tell you what your GPU is doing. From the front, the monitor has the usual Acer Predator aesthetic. So it has quite an angular design. The stand base is nice and solid. It's also rather deep and the stand does certainly go back quite far. So. If you have your wall behind your monitor and you've got it as far back as you can push it pretty much, the stand, there'll be around a foot between your wall and your screen. So just be aware of that. The material used on the stand, it's a nice powder coated metal design, gives a really nice premium look and feel to it. A nice solid feel as well. As usual, there are little sort of rubberized pads underneath the stand so it doesn't scratch your desk when it just sits there. But do be aware, it is a heavy monitor. It's a metal stand and the pads don't go completely to the edge. So when you're maneuvering it around on your desk or wherever, just be aware of that um, and be careful so you don't want to scratch your desk or the other surface it's sitting on. The bottom bezel has a matte black plastic finish and there's a shiny silver Predator logo in the middle. The top and side bezels have a frameless design, a dual stage bezel design, so it has a slender hard outer plastic component, as well as a slim panel border. The panel border is flush with the rest of the screen and it blends in quite nicely when the screen's off, as you can see now, but when the screen's on, you'll be able to see that panel border around the image. Also note that, as usual for dual stage bezel design, there are some little calibration marks. You can see one in the top right corner, for example, just a little patch, and there's the same in the other corner where it's not covered with blackness. That's completely normal. It's just calibration marks for the machine that puts everything together. As explored elsewhere in the review, a light matte screen surface is used. This offers pretty good glare handling and it also keeps the image fairly crisp, fairly vibrant and with decent clarity and that's explored elsewhere in the review. There's also a curve to the screen and when you walk around it or you sort of move your head around it, it becomes exaggerated. 
be exaggerated by the camera, uh, various videos and photos of the monitor you'll see. But when you're just sitting in front of the monitor, just using it normally, I really don't see it as a big issue. It's quite subtle, actually. It's something most users will just adapt to and get used to. A few final things to note from the front. There's a cable tidy loop, and that has a kind of metallic blue colour. It's probably not quite as vivid as it generally would appear on the video. It actually blends in rather nicely. It uh, just sort of sits there. It's not a bright, colourful element, but it's just a little splash of colour. And there's also this... NVIDIA G-Sync Ultimate sticker. Now, it's just a sticker, you can remove it, but because this is a review sample, it's polite to leave that kind of thing on. And at the top of the screen, there is a light sensor, and that's explored in the OSD video. In the middle there, you can see it. From the side, the monitor has a very robust look. The screen is rather thick because of the fancy backlight technology and other gubbins inside the monitor. And the stand itself as well, as I mentioned, nice and solid. It offers good ergonomic flexibility as well. You can tilt the screen backwards, as I've done there. I didn't do it whilst holding the camera because unfortunately it's rather heavy and thick and difficult to do with one hand. Or you can tilt it forwards a little bit as well. And you can also swivel it left and right. And you can adjust the height. And that's a rather stiff adjustment, very difficult to do with one hand. But the exact amounts you can adjust everything by is explored in the written review. You also notice for a little visual interest there's a kind of metallic looking set of discs here for want of a better term. Um, they're, they are plastic although they sort of have a metallic look to them and as you swivel the monitor you can see the lineup of the discs changes slightly. So that is actually the turntable mechanism for the stand there. At the rear of the monitor, it's predominantly matte black plastic. There are some grey elements. For example, the stand itself, which as I mentioned, is powder coated metal and the powder coated metal continues towards the top as well. There's a silver coloured Predator logo in the middle and there are these sort of wing areas which have a kind of metallic silver look. They're actually plastic, but they have a metallic silver look and these house the RGB lighting feature, which is explored in the OSD video. And they're also explored in the OSD video, the OSD controls themselves, which includes a joystick and some pressable buttons. The stand attaches centrally, and it doesn't have a quick release mechanism, but it has this little plastic shroud surrounding it. And if you remove that, you can just use a butter knife or a thin screwdriver, or perhaps a coin, whatever you want, just to gently prise it off. I'm not going to do that, um, but I have shown a little image in the written review with this removed, the shroud removed. So if you do want to mount the monitor using an alternative 100 by 100 millimeter VESA compatible solution and you've removed the shroud, you've got your little VESA holes there, you have to be aware that there is the ventilation system, as I've mentioned there, the fan, and you don't want to just completely block that off. So the monitor does include a little standoff bracket to ensure that the monitor has the required ventilation. And the ventilation slats there will do their thing as well, keeps it all cool. There are also some integrated speakers which are explored a little bit in the written review. I don't have an awful lot to say about them. They're not exactly the best speakers. Decent volume, reasonable bassiness, uh, but they give a bit of a muffled sound output to be honest, so they're not really going to keep audiophiles happy. Towards the right side, there is a K-slot. And I know I was talking about speakers when I was talking about these ventilation stats, but I've just realised there are actually some little speaker grills here, and I believe the speakers are actually behind there rather than behind there. But either way, as I mentioned, sort of muffled sound output, not incredible. The ports are down firing. There's a DC power input that's just there. So the monitor has an external power brick. And this is the power brick, the power adapter. It's rather on the large side. It certainly lives up to the name power brick. There's an HDMI 2 port, which doesn't offer the full functionality of the monitor. You can't use G-Sync, for example, and you're limited to a lower refresh rate. Um, I haven't tested it myself, but I believe it's 100 hertz at the native resolution. There's a DisplayPort 1.4 output, which offers the full 200 hertz at 3440 by 1440, plus support for NVIDIA G-Sync. Now, I'm just going around the other side there. There's a USB 3 upstream port, and there are three USB 3 downstream ports. The final port there, the little single one on its own, 
It also has a little battery icon because it supports fast charging for connected devices. And there is a 3.5mm headphone jack. I'm now going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. And to start off, I have to look at a key feature of this monitor, and that is the fact that it has a 512 dimming zone local dimming backlight solution, the FALD full array local dimming solution. And this is used under HDR, but you can also use it under SDR by enabling the SDR variable backlight feature in the OSD. So you can access this in the main OSD menu. It's under the picture settings, SDR variable backlight. Now I've enabled this, you'll likely see some changes to the image in the video. It's difficult to capture this accurately in the video. Sometimes certain things are exaggerated in the video and other times things don't quite come across properly. But to the eye, you can see a great enhancement to the perceived contrast. So when you look at the bright areas of the image, the tiger's whiskers, for example, they're nice and bright. Whereas the dark area of the image, particularly this sort of mass of black here, is really nice and dark. But it is lightened a bit around the icons there, around the elements on the taskbar down there, and also around the tiger's whiskers and, and, and other white areas of the tiger. And that's because with 512 dimming zones, as you can imagine, it's a large screen. It is a decent number of dimming zones, but it's not a massive number of dimming zones. So some of this content is a mixture of light and dark, and it will cover individual dimming zones. The dimming zone can't just cut itself off to really dark values. It has to kind of compensate for the overall mixture of light and dark being displayed. And that means that compared to the dimming zones that are just displaying very dark content, such as the black here, the, 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 back, the blacks contained there in these dimming zones are a bit lighter. As I said, it's not really very easy to capture properly on the video, and I'm not really sure how this is going to look on the video, but I do notice that to my eye if I'm sitting in a dark room in particular. However, the effect is not as pronounced as it is on the 27-inch 4K IPS type models with the 384 dimming zones. The strong native contrast of this VA panel does help in that respect. Also note that you can manually adjust the brightness with the SDR backlight feature enabled, the SDR variable backlight feature. What I would recommend is just set it to about what you would have under normal conditions because you will have chosen that brightness for a reason, because it's a comfortable brightness for you. Um, in my case, that's the brightness level of 32. You might want to go a little bit higher um, if you can cause kind of stomach the extra brightness a bit, but you will actually raise the black depth. and. It's easy to sort of look at this from a technical perspective using numbers and in the written review this is all covered. You'll find that I measured a contrast ratio of around 7000 to 1 with this feature active. It didn't really change a lot depending on the brightness and that's because the black point was raised as well as the white point that I measured. But that is still a big increase in contrast over the native contrast of the monitor which was closer to 3000 or 3500 to 1. If you go off angle, you take the camera off angle or look at it from an angle with your eyes, you can see the halo effect I was describing before a lot more clearly. And that's because it's sort of capturing VA glow. And when you go off angle on a VA panel like this, you do get a great degree of glow. But unlike IPS type panels, you don't get that from a normal viewing position. The halo effect can also be rather pronounced on the desktop when you are on certain websites with big masses of individual shade. The Overclockers Forum, the OC UK Forum, is a good example of this. I'm not sure if this will come out on the video, but essentially... <sighs> the OC UK Forums is a good example of this. It has a large area of individual shade and it has some brighter content, some white text around there. Um, the dimming zones there have to lighten up for the lighter content, whereas the dimming zones that just display the sort of the black lines and the blue background are much dimmer. And you can also see a kind of halo, or I can see a halo as I move the mouse, sort of dimming zone that follows the mouse around. But, but when you're playing a game or watching a movie, you don't really have these sort of massive areas of flat colour, and you're not sort of staring at static areas of flat colour. So I really actually very much like to use this setting when I'm watching movies or playing games, but when I'm on the desktop, I kind of find this halo effect a little bit more annoying, so I tend not to use this. 
I will certainly talk about this using in-game examples shortly. And when I'm watching Netflix as well, which I won't be doing in the video, but it is something I do in general, I do like to have this setting enabled. I've actually got a nice grey shade which shows the spotlighting effect very nicely and shows it clearly in the video. So you can see as I move the mouse around, you can see the kind of halo around the mouse. And again, in-game and in movies, you're not really going to get this kind of thing. I'm just showing you this example to highlight the effect in an obvious way. Now, there's also another setting related to this, backlight response. I've got that set to gaming. I'd recommend you use gaming. This is really just a speed of responsiveness for the backlight dimming zones. There's hybrid, which is a bit slower. So it's actually still quite fast. If it's not quite as fast as gaming. So the halo effect kind of could trail a little bit in some situations. The desktop setting is considerably slower and you get sort of a smear of you basically get a smear of halos as you move the mouse, so that's not attractive at all. I would just stick to the gaming setting. I don't see any reason to use the slower settings. There's no sort of disadvantage to using gaming, in my opinion. Whilst I'm on the desktop, I'm going to discuss Black Crush. And this is a phenomenon with VA panels whereby perceived gamma changes depending on which bit of the screen you're looking at. The bit that you're looking at directly has much higher perceived gamma, and it's kind of operates in a cone and it will be where the camera's looking at directly or where your eyes are looking at directly when you're actually using the monitor. And this means that darker shades are darker than they should be. Not black, it doesn't affect black itself, but slightly lighter shades than that are darker than they should be and not quite as distinct as they should be. And that means you can lose some detail, some subtle details are sort of blended into a black mass. So. My website has a nice little integrated test for this kind of thing. It's not really a test, but it just happens to have a little faint grey honeycomb mesh pattern against a very dark background. And you can see the bit that the camera is pointing at directly around where it says PC monitors is more blended together than areas around the screen. And as I move the camera, you can see things get more or less visible, um, or at least you should be able to. Again, I'm not sure if the camera will pick this up properly. Just in case it doesn't, I'm now using the Legom test for viewing angles. Again, this isn't represented as you'd see it by eye. It'll certainly show the effect as you move the angle. You can, you can definitely see the sort of VA glow come out, but that's really not really what I'm trying to show you. Um, you can see the visibility of those blocks change, and as you're directly in front of them, they're not as visible, especially at the top row. The Black Crush on this model, as I'll talk about in-game, is actually about as low as I've seen on a VA panel though. It is a characteristic of all VA panels to varying degrees. This one isn't really too bad, but it does still exist on this panel. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about contrast using some in-game examples. There are plenty of scenes on this title which demand a strong contrast performance for lots of dimly lit caves and caverns and tombs and all sorts of things like that, dark passageways, with just sort of a few point sources of illumination lighting them up. So the fire here, for example, and the glowing eyes of that skull and the little creature up there, they're all very nice and bright and they contrast very nicely with the darker surroundings. As a VA panel, this monitor does have strong native contrast. I measured around 3,500 to 1 using my test settings, so that's after adjustments made. Also be aware that at the moment I'm not using the SDR variable backlight solution. You can see you can see a bit of a VA glow, as I mentioned before. You can see that towards the bottom of the screen from a normal viewing position, but the camera does exaggerate this. I can already see from the preview screen of the camera that this is more exaggerated than it is by eye, by quite a, a way. Um, but at least it can sort of show you what I'm talking about by VA glow. So you can see that kind of purple haze there. It's really not anywhere near that noticeable by eye. It does depend how far away you're sitting from the monitor. If you're sitting close to the monitor, then it does bloom out a bit more. But I tend to sit around 70 centimetres from the monitor if I can. This monitor is quite a deep design, as I mentioned elsewhere in the review. So it might be difficult if you don't have a very deep desk to sort of sit much further than, say, 70 centimetres away. But that's an absolutely fine viewing distance for this monitor, in my opinion. The VA glow is not really a big feature on this monitor. It doesn't really destroy the atmosphere or anything like that. The black crush is also apparent, and again, it's really a minor feature on this monitor. Although you can't see it in this particular scene, this 
game has very porous rock textures and you use that porous rock texture as an indication that you can actually climb a wall using your ice picks and you can always see that even with the black crush you can always see what rocks have that texture but for the areas of the screen you're looking at directly so kind of reasonably central areas from a normal viewing position you can't see the texture as clearly as you can towards the edges of the screen for example but again the black crush isn't extreme and you can see a, a few examples here so the sort of shadowy areas here they're less distinct towards the center of the screen than they are peripherally and i'm not sure if this will be picked up very well by the camera but to my eye i can see that but it's not an extreme difference and unlike some va models i wouldn't say that the areas towards the edge of the screen show obvious low gamma or anything like that because some va models can have basically banding or a blocky effect because details are much less masked than they should be and they're really obvious and that gives sort of banding artifacts and blockiness and various things which are actually part of the game or the content itself but should really be more masked than that. So on this model that's not an issue and the bright elements there really do stand out very nicely, they're nice and bright. I'm now going to turn on the STR variable dimming solution just to show you what that does. As I mentioned before this does enhance the contrast quite a bit. You will not see the exact nature of this change on the video because it doesn't capture things like that properly. But you can already see that VA glow I mentioned before has actually gone now, even in the video. And certainly by eye, I can't notice it at all. So that's nice. And that's because the backlight zones for the darker areas can dim effectively. Whereas for this really bright content, like the fire there and the skulls there, it's nice and bright. So that's really good. The sort of halo effect I mentioned and showed you on the desktop not really an issue here. There is certainly a halo effect still. Around the skull there, the game naturally has a glow around the skull anyway, but a bit further out, sort of here, the blacks aren't, the blacks or very dark shades aren't quite as dark as they could be. That's because they're shared with dimming zones that are showing the really bright content. They're not as deep as the dimming zones further out. But, but I'm sitting in a dark room here, and even then, I don't find this problematic. And it doesn't really break the atmosphere in my opinion, it's not a strong effect. So overall, I really like to use the STR local dimming solution on games like this, or just any game really. I don't really find its drawbacks obvious, as I might on the desktop. And I certainly see enhance the contrast in a really nice way. Just to finish off, I also like to mention the screen surface. It's something I always like to comment on. I mentioned that elsewhere in the review, but just to reiterate, it doesn't have an obvious grainy look when you observe lighter shades, such as the fire there. It has a fairly smooth look, just a sort of very light misty graininess, if anything. But it's not the kind of graininess that most users will even notice. So that's not a problem on this monitor. I'm now going to talk about the colour reproduction of the monitor. And as usual, I like to start with the Legom, that's legom.nl, the website, and their tests for viewing angles. So the Legom text test, this should appear a blended grey throughout. And on this model, as typical for a VA model, it appears more blended towards the middle of the screen. There's actually a little bit of a green tint to the striping, but it's a fairly blended grey overall. And towards the edges, you can see that it has a red tint to the striping. So it's kind of like a circle in the middle, a large circle where it's more blended, and some regions at the end which are less blended and have a red hue. And the more blended region shifts alongside head movement. And there's a shift in where the red striping appears as well. This indicates that there's a moderate viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. This kind of behavior is typical for VA models. The circle in the middle, it's kind of similar to the, the cone, which causes black crush. It's all about differences in perceived gamma and changes at different points of the screen follows you around much like the sort of cone of more blended appearance for the dark shades as with the black crush. The purple block appears a bluish purple throughout. It has more of a pink hue towards the edges and the bottom of the screen and the pink hue shifts readily along with head movement or in this case camera movement. The red block appears a good rich red for the most part especially towards the top of the screen. It appears a kind of more faded red lower down and towards the edges of the screen it 
the side edges, it kind of appears a bit of a dimmer red, less saturated. And it, this is about as consistent as I've actually seen from a VA model, the, the red shade here, so that's good. The green block, that appears a good consistent, slightly yellowish green throughout. Technically it's a green chartreuse colour. It doesn't have the same strength of yellowing as models with weaker colour gamuts would show, nor does it have the same kind of strength of, of green, the green hue, as models with wider colour gamuts. But in terms of the consistency, it's quite good, especially for the panel type. As usual, the blue block appears a good consistent blue throughout. There can be some differences in how it appears in terms of brightness, depending on your screen's uniformity. My sample doesn't really have an issue there, so it's uh, good consistent blue. And I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. So I'm on Battlefield 5 at the moment. This monitor provides a fairly vibrant look to the image and it has decent colour consistency, as I'd mentioned with the Legom, certainly compared to TN models, much better in that respect. So it maintains good richness throughout the screen. There is a little bit of a loss of saturation further out. So some of these green shades, for example, look a little bit more muted towards the edges of the screen and the bottom of the screen, but it's not an extreme difference by any means. And I would say that overall it has a nice vibrant look. Part of the reason for the vibrant look, it's not just because of the consistency of the panel, it's also to do with the colour gamut, and this extends a fair bit beyond sRGB. So content like this, I'm running the game in normal SDR mode, that's really designed with the sRGB colour space in mind. So if you've got a monitor like this, where the colour gamut natively extends quite a bit beyond that, you do get extra saturation, but it's even extra saturation. It isn't like some monitors with traditional wide gamuts, Adobe RGB for example, where you might get some skews in the colour where some regions of the gamut are really high, other regions that the coverage is much lower. So it has a much more even look to the extra saturation. And it isn't actually an extreme boost in saturation. It isn't as high as, for example, the Asus PG27UQ or the Acer X27. Those models have a much more generous colour gamut even than this. So this monitor has a specified colour gamut of around 90% DCI P3, and from my testing that looks about right. So there is a bit of extension beyond sRGB, a decent amount of extension, but it's not an extreme colour gamut. Some users really will like this look, others might not like it. It does offer an sRGB emulation mode, and I'll just show you that briefly. So if you go into the OSD and go onto the colour menu, you can see there's a feature SDR Colors sRGB. If you turn that on, it runs in an sRGB emulation mode. Unfortunately, it isn't actually very good emulation mode. It actually offers a lot of undercoverage of the sRGB color space. Um, things just look quite washed out, to be honest. Um, and certainly don't look as nice and rich and appealing, in my opinion, as just using the native gamut. So it's there if you want to use it, but for the remainder of the view I'm going to just use the native gamut of the monitor and discuss that. So the vibrant elements such as the fire there stand out very nicely. It has quite a, a rich almost reddish orange hue and um, actually does have a quite a bit of sort of a, a reddish orange hue. The yellows as well they look really nice and vibrant although they kind of verge on orange a bit because of the fairly generous colour gamut. There are plenty of nice rich green colours. These nice autumnal colours stand out very nicely as well. The sky there looks fairly saturated. Um, not, not extremely saturated, not in a kind of cartoonish way, but it just kind of looks rich. So, as I said, many users will like this kind of look, and it's certainly an area where this monitor is relatively strong. I should also mention, with respect to the saturation levels, which do shift a little bit, as I said, towards the edges of the screen and towards the bottom. That effect becomes more pronounced if you're closer to the screen. The shifts are more pronounced. Not, not really very easy to see in the video, they're not really dramatic shifts by any means, but if you're sitting quite close to the monitor you might notice the saturation loss is a bit more extreme than if you're sitting further away. And as I said, the monitor is quite deep. I tend to sit around 70 centimetres from the monitor if I can, sometimes a bit closer than that, sometimes a little bit further away, it depends on my posture. I'm on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to talk about the HDR, High Dynamic Range Performance of the monitor. I'm using the same graphic settings I was using for the colour reproduction section, but I've turned on HDR. 
and you'll probably see in the video even that things look very different although you won't be able to see the nature of this difference on the video unfortunately but it basically looks a lot more believable and lifelike the daylight looks a lot brighter and there is a much better nuance of different shades displayed especially in the sky and again this won't come across as a video you can just kind of see a big ball of light there but actually there's a really nice fine gradient of different light shades in the sky and a really beautiful glow to the clouds. This monitor supports VESA Display HDR 1000, it's VESA Display HDR 1000 certified. That uses the HDR10 pipeline and ticks various important boxes for HDR. So one thing is that it supports 10-bit colour reproduction. As I mentioned before, the GPU might handle the dithering if you're using a refresh rate that's higher than 144 Hz at the native resolution, but the end result is very similar and I mentioned that before so I wouldn't worry about that I would just use whatever refresh rate you're comfortable using but do be aware of this and to be honest it's quite difficult to get such a high frame rate on content like this so it might be that you find setting the monitor to 144 hertz more suitable anyway when you're running HDR content and that will mean the dithering is handled by the monitor so it uses an 8-bit signal with 2 bits of dithering versus 8 bits of signal on the monitor and 2 bits of dithering on the GPU. So what this 10-bit precision does, it really enhances the tone mapping. So I've mentioned the light shades there and the gradient, very nice indeed. It also affects the dark shades, so there's a much nicer variety of subtly different dark shades and that makes shadow detailing such as the detail under this vehicle there and around the wheel arch and around the tyre a lot more realistic looking, a lot more believable. Very nice. Um, the lighting control as well, I've mentioned that this monitor has a 512 dimming zone FALD, full array local dimming solution, that's put to excellent use under HDR. It allows bright elements such as the sky up there, this fire there, to really stand out very nicely indeed, whereas the dark elements such as beneath this vehicle there and some of the more shaded areas up here, the sort of the shadow detailing around the rock to be nice and dim, whereas these elements are really nice and bright, very eye-catching indeed, much more eye-catching than under SDR. And it's pumping out a luminance, a maximum luminance of over a thousand candles per meter squared I actually measured, so really they have excellent brightness and a really nice eye-catching look, these bright elements. The colour gamut of this monitor, as I mentioned in the colour reproduction section, it's about 90% DCI-P3, but because HDR actually targets the DCI-P3 colour space in the near term, that means that content like this can be mapped more appropriately, and you don't get that kind of oversaturation that I noticed under SDR. The woody tones on the rifles that my teammates are using here, they are toned down so they don't have a sort of overly red hue, the autumnal colours have a lovely variety and the red cast again is toned down a bit and sort of you get more neutral looking browns and they do have a bit of a rich red tone where it's warranted but it just looks more natural and more as the developers intend. There's also some really nice deep green colours, they have less of a sort of yellow saturated cast and which you get a bit of that under SDR so it's nice to have that toned down a bit but the vibrant elements are definitely vibrant so the fire here, for example, looks beautifully eye-catching and it uses colours that are well beyond what you'd see if you're just looking at the sRGB colour space. They're well beyond the sRGB gamut. It also takes a bit of an edge off the sort of reddening hue that you get with the oranges there I've mentioned before. And the yellows don't verge on orange, so they look more appropriate. The variety is maintained, but the vibrancy is still very good indeed. And in fact, coupled with the high brightness, really very eye-catching. Another thing worth mentioning, under HDR, you don't get very much control in the OSD. Everything's sort of automatically configured. Well, not everything, but most things are automatically configured. So you'll see that you can't control the brightness. It's called Ref White Nits, Reference White Nits. You can't actually control that on this model. It's set automatically. It's greyed out. That's just a sort of hangover from the Acer X27 and the older G-Sync HDR models where you could actually control the white nits yourself. But that actually caused more trouble than it was worth because different units seem to have different optimal values and it was just confusing users. So I'm quite happy that you can't control that. Contrast again, grayed out. Lots of things grayed out. Of course, the SDR variable backlight setting grayed out. 
Backlight response you can control, but again, just leave that on gaming for the fastest response. Color, you can't control things like the gamma. That's all optimized for HDR automatically. You can manually adjust the color temperature, much as you can under SDR. So different units have a slightly different balance there. So if you notice that the cast is a bit off, then you can adjust that under HDR, much as you can under SDR. And I've just noticed another element. So just before I move on to showing you Shadow of the Tomb Raider, there's a wet patch of ground there, which reflects the light from the sun. So when I look directly at the sun on the game, it's exceptionally bright, really uses a very, very strong luminance output there. Again, the local dimming, so the whole screen doesn't just look flooded. It's just that particular element, it's really nice and bright. And the reflection there as well is very bright, not as bright, but still very bright indeed. Again, it just has a really nice natural quality to it. And the daylight in general is just really lifted up and it doesn't just universally flood everything like you'd get if you just had an extremely high brightness under SDR, especially without any sort of local dimming. Whereas the more shaded areas over there to the right, they look nice and appropriately rich and deep. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again running under HDR, and I'm gonna show you one of my favorite scenes on this title and actually really any title I've experienced under HDR for sort of showing off some of the effects, especially on a model with local dimming like this, effective local dimming, I should say. So again, the 10-bit color precision is very much noticeable in terms of the detailed look you get in darker areas like this. It doesn't just look sort of flooded in a way that you get if you just lowered the gamma. It's very different to that because there's still really nice distinctions with the rocks there. It's just that there's a very nice variety of very dark shades so that really helps sort of bring these objects out in a nice realistic way. The colour reproduction again is changed under HDR. Things look nice and vibrant but they also look more natural so the vegetation here has less of a yellow cast. It has a really nice lush green look to it. Lara's skin looked a little bit suntanned under SDR, just a little bit, not a strong sort of effect as you would get with a model with the wider colour gamut, an even wider colour gamut than this, but it did have a little bit of an extra tanned look. It's more toned down now, so she looks more like she should. The rays of light there really show a beautiful smooth gradient and there's a sort of hazy effect. Again, you can't see this on the video properly, it just looks like a very bright ball of light, but there's actually a nice array of bright to very bright shades there, handled very nicely indeed by the monitor. And that contrasts really nicely with the much deeper shades there. And again, the local dimming's doing its thing, the FALD solution to make sure that that's appropriately displayed. And a bit further in, there are some really good shaded areas. Again, showing nice depth to the shadow detailing and a nice variety. What I would say is, although it's not really obvious on this scene, you've got 512 dimming zones, you've got many million pixels on this monitor, um, so, so the darker shades could be deeper than they are, and some of the slightly brighter shades right next to them could be a little bit less deep, I suppose, and certainly if you look, for example, at the very bright shades up there, transitioning to the very dark shades, there's a sort of crossover with the dimming zones there, like I showed you under SDR with the local dimming solution. So it's not perfect in that respect, but you don't really notice, um, certainly in scenes like this, this kind of effect anyway. I'm gonna show you scenes with more extreme contrast now. So if you're a good dedicated viewer of the channel, um, you will notice that I like this scene when I'm talking about HDR, but I also like to use it when I'm talking about just contrast in general under SDR. And I did show that earlier in the video I also showed you how enabling the SDR variable backlight solution enhanced the overall look of this scene. It's now enhanced even further under HDR and really it's very dynamic indeed. So the bright elements here look exceptionally bright, the skull there as well, really bright, the fire in particular, but it doesn't just look like a big ball of white as it probably appears on the video. You can actually see a lovely gradient of very bright shades. So there's a kind of white core to the fire. Then around there, there's some really nice vibrant white yellows and oranges and some deeper oranges and slightly reddish oranges further out. So really nice variety there. Excellent use of the local dimming. Whereas the darker shades, 
especially up here, look really nice and deep. They have much nicer depth to them. I mean, they aren't sort of super deep and that's because, again, there's a mixture of very dark shades for the shadow detailing and somewhat brighter shades where you can see that the glints off the gold there, for example, the gold color. So the dimming zones can't just completely shut off there because there's a mixture of content covering them. Another issue, I mentioned haloing before under SDR with the variable backlight solution enabled. As you would imagine, under HDR, you've got the variable backlight doing its thing as well, the local dimming solution. But it's even more dynamic because those shades are even brighter. These shades are even dimmer or trying to be. So around the skull there, the shades aren't quite as deep as they could be. It's not exactly a distinct halo effect, even when you're sitting in a fairly dark room. You can see that they're brighter than the shades further out, though. Uh, sorry, I'll stop moving the camera. That made it a bit confusing. So the shades further out there are much deeper than the shades there, if you sort of compare and contrast. But really, when you're just playing the game in general, this isn't something I find obvious. There's also a little bit of a sort of bloom of light around the golden highlights here, they're reflecting light very strongly. So some of the deep shades next to them are a little bit lighter than they should be. Again, a bit of a halo effect going on. But this halo effect is much less pronounced than it is on the 27 inch 4K models with G-Sync HDR. And the strong native contrast of the VA panel really helps in that respect. I'm not saying they're entirely absent. And certainly if you watch even more extreme examples than this, although this is actually quite a good example of the halo effect under HDR, but if you look at those little HDR videos that show off HDR specifically, you'll see that they have some really bright objects with basically a black background, and you can see the sort of halo effect around the bright objects and the deeper shades further out look deeper. That's natural, you can't really escape that when you've got 512 dimming zones over such a large screen. But as I say, it's not a major issue in my opinion, and it's not something that really breaks away from the overall atmosphere and which is really excellent under HDR. I'm quite comfortable to say this is the best HDR experience I've had on a monitor, um, and I've tested quite a few now, so that's certainly saying something. And really for scenes like this, it just brings an extra dimension which you just don't get under SDR or even on monitors with weaker HDR performance. The issue I'm about to highlight, a flickering issue, was something that quite bugged me on my unit, and that's why I decided to record a little video to show it. The good news is that I've been in contact with Acer, who have also talked to NVIDIA about the issue, and essentially it's an issue which affects all units using this panel and the same NVIDIA hardware inside. It's also an issue which NVIDIA are going to be able to rectify in an upcoming driver update. In fact, the next driver update after the one I'm using for this review. So by the time you're actually watching this video, the issue may well have already been resolved, or if not, it should be shortly after that. So that's good news, and it means you can probably skip through this section. It may well not be relevant, but if you're interested in the issue anyway, even if it may not be relevant anymore, continue to watch this section. I'm now going to highlight a bit of an issue I've been having with this monitor on some games and in some scenarios on some games. It's particularly prevalent on Battlefield 5 as I'm playing now, and it's an issue which occurs when certain textures are displayed or certain combinations of light and dark shades are displayed. And you get this sort of flickering effect which covers the whole screen. You also get very obvious interlacing patterns, so you can see a vertical pinstripe effect this won't come out on the video, I'm pretty sure this won't come out on the video, it's hard to capture this on a camera, um, you'll probably be able to see the flickering, but the interlace patterns, it sort of breaks up the shades uh, in the sky, beneath the arch there for example, into pretty broad bands of alternating lighter and darker shade than intended, and this really does catch the eye, the kind of dancing lines, or inversion artifacts, whatever you want to call them, and I believe this is related to the voltage control of the monitor having some issues. In addition to it only happening when there's certain text is displayed, I mean, this, this archway here causes a lot, um, especially the flickering, but also the interlaced patterns, which you can't really see clearly on the video, but I can certainly see to my eye when I'm a normal distance from the monitor. And you can see the refresh rate in the top right corner. This issue only occurs when the refresh rate of the display is above about 80 hertz, 
and it doesn't matter if you've got G-Sync active or not, although it does seem more prevalent in a variable refresh rate environment, a variable frame rate environment. So if I'm using a static refresh rate, I can see the issue, but it's not quite as widespread and not quite as strong. But when G-Sync is active, it certainly is noticeable. It doesn't matter if HDR is active or if I'm using normal SDR either. One thing that does completely stop the issue happening, however, is if the overdrive is set to off rather than normal or extreme. So now the issue has gone. There's not the flickering, there aren't the dancing lines, the interlaced patterns. Although naturally this isn't an ideal solution, you obviously get a lot more perceived blur and the pixel responses are way too slow. The overdrive is quite effective, but unfortunately it does cause this issue. And with the OSD open, you can actually see the background of the OSD flickering and it also displays these interlaced patterns. But again, when the overdrive is off, it doesn't occur. If it's set to extreme, obviously that's visually quite horrible anyway, but the specific issue does occur, the flickering and the interlaced patterns. I'm just going to set the frame rate cap in the game and that will mean that the refresh rate of the display is different to what it is now, so I'm just letting it sort of roam free, go as high as it can at the moment. But if I set this to 75, the issue disappears completely because that's below 80 frames a second. I'm not sure if it's exactly 80 hertz, um, the, the sort of threshold for this occurring, but it certainly doesn't Oh, I haven't noticed it happen at all below 80 hertz. If I set this to 85, let's say, 85 hertz, the issue comes back. And as I mentioned before, it does occur under HDR and it occurs whether you've got local dimming active or not. Although deactivating the local dimming does seem to make it slightly less common but I certainly noticed it quite a lot on this title, on Battlefield 5, on multiplayer as well as single player. I also noticed it on Fallout 76, especially in foggy environments. So it seems to be when there are lots of lighter and medium shades being displayed on the screen. I didn't actually notice it much um, or at all actually on Tomb Raider. I might have noticed it once or twice, I'm not really sure. And on Mass Effect Andromeda, I didn't really notice it, but they're predominantly dark games, so I think it has something to do with the medium and lighter textures and shades. I'm now on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor supports a refresh rate of up to 200 Hz. I'm using it at 200 Hz at the moment, and that brings with it a few advantages. One advantage is that it greatly enhances what I call the connected feel. And that describes the precision and the fluidity you feel when you're interacting with the game world. As with many aspects I talk about in this video, you, you certainly can't appreciate this in the video. But it's something which people will understand if they've used a high refresh rate monitor before. This is separate to input lag, although input lag also affects the connected feel. So it means even if you've got a monitor with really low input lag, but it has a much lower refresh rate than this, it just doesn't have the same precision or fluidity when you interact with the world. Compared to a 60Hz monitor, or indeed this monitor running at 60Hz, it's outputting up to three and a third times as much information every second. And I've got the game running at around 200 frames a second at the moment, so I'm really making the most out of the refresh rate. Speaking of input lag, this monitor has a low level of input lag. I measured under five milliseconds, and that considers the pixel response element as well as the signal delay. And it means that the monitor has a good low signal delay, which is the element of input lag you feel, and that's what most people really want to know about when they consider input lag. The other aspect of this 200 hertz refresh rate is that it gives the monitor a good low perceived blur level overall. Perceived blur is a concept which is explored a little bit in a summary in the written review and also in more detail in an article on our website all about monitor responsiveness. This doesn't just cover perceived blur, it covers lots of other things in detail, but perceived blur is really one of the key concepts to understand when it comes to the sort of experience that a high refresh rate monitor can give you. This means that even during rapid movement of a game like this, the game world has a lot more clarity than it does. 
on a 60 hertz monitor. And this is also tied to the frame rate, so you can't just have the monitor running at 200 hertz and running at 60 frames a second. Then your perceived blur level is really just going to be like a 60 hertz monitor. So you do need a good high frame rate to take advantage of this aspect, just like the connected feel. And I should have really mentioned, uh, just to summarise really, the perceived blur decreases at increased frame rates and refresh rates because it reduces the amount of time your eyes spend moving and it's actually the eye movement which creates a lot of perceived blur you'll see on a monitor. The other aspect is the pixel responses and sluggish pixel responses can certainly contribute to perceived blur and give sort of standout weaknesses in terms of trailing or ghosting if you prefer that term. On this model, it is a VA model, so it is not perfect in terms of pixel responses, but it is one of the faster VA models I've used. So here, most of the transitions are between light and medium shades. There are a few darker shades mixed in as well, but it really doesn't have any standout weaknesses. Even the darker shades here moving against the lighter background. On some VA models, you'd actually get an obvious smearing as you moved your mouse around there. On this model, that doesn't happen for this transition or these transitions, so that's good to see. There are some transitions which cause what I'd call powdery trailing, fairly light powdery trailing for the most part. So where there are very bright shades, such as where it says motor trial here and the icon, so it's white against a kind of medium background, there is a bit of a powdery trail. It probably won't come out on the video because it's quite a faint powdery trail. It just breaks off a little bit from the white area and it creates a little bit of extra perceived blur. That's not, again, it's not strong, it's not smeary or anything like that in this example. And really, most of the time you don't really get any obvious weaknesses and certainly on scenes like this you don't. There's nothing that really stands out. But I will show you some examples of high contrast transitions with some different scenes on this game. And they're the kind of transitions which VA models really do struggle with. But as I said, this model isn't too bad. And actually just before showing you that, I think it's best to set the scene with some examples comparing to some other high refresh rate VA models because I've used a lot of them over the years. On the upper end, the fastest ones, that would be something like the LG32 GK850G, a G-Sync model. 32 inches or 31.5 inches technically with 165 hertz refresh rate. Now this model, if you're running it with the faster response time setting and you have it set to a high refresh rate and you've also got G-Sync active in the graphics driver, the pixel responses are actually very fast on that for a VA model. There isn't a lot of smeary trailing. There's a little bit of powder trailing in places, so it's not perfect, but really as far as VA models go, it's about as good as you're gonna see. Competitively speaking, I can quite happily game on that monitor. And it's a bit of an odd one because it does need G-Sync to be active in the graphics driver for it to have its optimal pixel responses. And that's strange. I haven't really come across that on other G-Sync models. And it's something that other reviewers unfortunately didn't pick up um, when they were testing the response times. Um, but, but anyway, it's a fast monitor when you've got it set up correctly. On the other end, you've got ones like the Acer Z35, not to be confused with this, the X35. The Z35 had a lot of smeary trailing, a lot of really much slower than optimal pixel transitions. Quite uncomfortable, competitively speaking. And at 200 hertz, there was also loads of overshoot. So it was really a bit of a pain to use. And then in the middle, you've got ones like the Samsung C27 HG70, which is quite decent, but again, there are some weaknesses. This model, I'd actually put somewhere between that Samsung I mentioned in the middle and between the LG. So I'm actually quite impressed with this overall. I'm not really a competitive gamer, but I do still like to do well in games. And although there are some weaknesses, and I will show you some of these very shortly on this model, I don't find they really impede my enjoyment of the game or really I don't feel competitively disadvantaged by them. But it's very subjective and you know, individual preferences and sensitivities do vary. There's a bit of overshoot now I've mentioned with the LG model and um, that is quite high, the LG 31.5 inch G-Sync model. And unfortunately this is something which you have to put up with if you're having a lot of greater to great acceleration to really speed up these slow pixel responses on VA models like this. But there's not a strong amount of overshoot. There's a little bit of halo trailing, bright halo trailing to the side of this building there as I move the mouse. 
probably won't come out on the video because it's actually not particularly bright or obvious. There are other examples of that as well. It just kind of gives a little fringe as you move past some of these objects and it's brighter than the background colour for the most part so it kind of stands out a bit. Uh, you can see it perhaps more clearly on the edge of the building there. And again I'm not sure if this is going to come out on the video but I can see it to my eye. So it does kind of stand out a bit because it's brighter but it's not extreme overshoot. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5 and this has some better examples of high contrast transitions and transitions which this model does struggle with a bit. You'll notice that my frame rate isn't really hitting 200 frames a second very comfortably, that's in the top right. Now it, it does dip a bit below that, but on the video and as far as the weaknesses I'm talking about here, they really manifest in a fairly similar way, whether it's at say 170 frames a second, 170 hertz, or 200 frames a second, 200 hertz. I've got G-Sync active, which is why the which is why the refresh rate is following the frame rate in that way. And I'll talk about G-Sync shortly, but there's a good example here of some slower than optimal pixel transitions. The flag there has a bit of a smeary quality to it, but it isn't the kind of extended smeary trailing like you get on some VA models. It just sort of stands out a bit because it's certainly slower than optimal. And, and that does naturally increase perceived blur. Some more examples of the shelter up here. You can see, or at least I can see, probably will come out in the video a bit as well. There's again a bit of a smeary trailing. It's a bit of what I call breakup trailing. Perhaps a better example of that with this flag actually. You can see some of the shades leach out from the flag, although it looks very much just like a black flag when it's static because it's a very dark shade. When you move, you can see some of those shades leach out. So you can see a kind of dark purple or blue trailing, sort of a smear around the flag. And these are much slower than optimal pixel transitions. But these aren't very widespread. This is just a very nice example of it. So you've got a very dark flag there with this sort of medium to dark background. And that causes these kind of slowest transitions you'll see on this model. Now these kind of transitions are really common on some VA models, you'll see them all over the place. On this one there's really just some sort of isolated examples. It depends what you're playing, the game you're playing and the area you're playing in really. But overall this is not a widespread issue, but it is something to be aware of and it's something which I am able to show you on the video because it does stand out a bit. The boats down here, on quite a few VA models you get this breakup trailing as you move the mouse. And it looks kind of like wetting a page that has water soluble ink on it and the ink kind of runs out it's that kind of effect and you can certainly see it on this model to an extent but it really doesn't have the heavy smeary quality that some va models have and yes it does stand out especially when you're moving the mouse like this but really as far as va models go and this is probably one of the worst examples of it it's not terrible some further examples, there's a little bit of overshoot in places. Around this lamp here, this often has overshoot for some reason, the uh, transitions here between the light and the medium shades, they often give overshoot on models that have a bit of overshoot. So it has a little bit of a sort of, I'd say, what I'd call dirty trailing, or a bit of shadowy trailing. It's not particularly dirty because it's not like a very strong, very dark trail, but it just gives a little bit of a highlight that's darker than the background colour even around the lamp. And there's a bit of overshoot around the tree here as well, a bit of bright halo trailing. There's also a little bit of powdery trailing mixed in. So again, these weaknesses, they're not particularly widespread, but there are examples and that's why I'm showing you this. In here, there is a bit of what I call heavy powdery trailing. Some people might say it has a bit of a smeary quality to it with the white there where it says E to pick up the letter against the darker background. And that's really quite similar to the example I was showing you before, but it's a bit of a heavier powdery trail rather than a light powdery trail. So it's quite slow pixel transitions there. You get that a bit around these pots here, which are illuminated with a darker background. And again, this kind of behaviour is probably not going to come out in an obvious way on the video because it's not really eye-catching compared to the smeary trailing. But as I said before, overall, although I don't consider myself a competitive gamer, I really do find it 
easy to game on this monitor and do quite well in the games I play. Um, actually frequently top the scoreboard on Battlefield 5 in fact. So as I say it's subjective but as far as I'm concerned this is one of the better VA models out there in terms of responsiveness. The monitor also supports G-Sync and that's definitely been doing its thing in this scene because it's difficult to maintain a solid 200 frames a second at a resolution of 3440 by 1440. I've really got the graphics settings very low at the moment and I've got an NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti so it's not really a sluggish GPU by any stretch of the imagination but even then it's difficult to maintain a solid 200 frames a second. So you can expect dips and with G-Sync it makes sure that the refresh rate of the monitor is equal to the frame rate of the game where possible. And without G-Sync you do get tearing and stuttering. You get tearing if you've got V-Sync enabled and you get stuttering if you've got V-Sync enabled. With G-Sync you don't get those interruptions and users like me who are sensitive to tearing and stuttering, G-Sync is really a very nice thing to have. You can have HDR enabled at the same time as G-Sync as well, that's not a problem. So it's really nice having this tearing and stuttering removed. Sensitivity to that does vary though, not everyone will notice it in the same way. Something I will mention and something I do like to mention when I'm talking about G-Sync is what happens as the refresh rate reduces a lot further than it is now. So at the moment there are just some dips but if I increase the graphic settings you'll see what happens. I've now got the graphic settings ramped up considerably. Frame rate is now around 100 frames a second so it's sort of half of what I was enjoying before. The connected feel isn't as good. The perceived blur is significantly higher. You can again see these sort of weaknesses. But the smeary trailing doesn't really stand out quite as much now and that's because there's just more perceived blur overall and the pixel response time and the pixel responsiveness requirements aren't as high. But you can still see it in places. But the nice thing is there's no tearing, there's no stuttering and you'd get that without G-Sync active. Sensitive users like me hate that kind of thing so it's really nice to have that absent and the monitor is doing very well to keep to the frame rate of the game with its refresh rate. I've upped the graphics settings further, it's now around 60 frames a second and again you can see those weaknesses in the pixel responses even here but again these are just some sort of isolated examples. Most pixel responses are fast enough for a good 200 hertz performance, let alone a good 60 hertz performance. But the connected feel reduced massively, perceived blur overall greatly increased, but the lack of tearing and stuttering really nice to have. And although I can't give any examples in this particular scene, if the frame rate does drop further, actually I will just try and increase my graphics settings further to see if I can get it to do this. The monitor has a frame rate counter built into it, you don't have to use the in-game one. It's actually a refresh rate counter, but as you can see here, the monitor isn't actually running at 28Hz because it can't do that, that's below 30Hz. However, it still displays 28 and that's because it knows exactly what's happening and it knows that the monitor's refresh rate is actually double that, so it's giving you a good indication of the frame rate rather than the refresh rate of the display, so that's a good feature. It's found in the OSD section of the OSD under refresh rate num, so if you turn that on that's how you get this. And again it indicates the frame rate very accurately if you've got G-Sync active. If you don't have G-Sync active it will have no idea what the frame rate of your content is so it won't work. It'll just display whatever static refresh rate you've selected for the game or in Windows or wherever else. As you can see from my frame rate it's much higher now. So the monitor is running at nice low graphic settings again and things appear much more fluid um, to my eye. Much lower perceived blur, much better connected feel, much nicer experience overall. Now another thing I'd like to talk about is the response time settings. I'm only going to go through this briefly. The standard setting is called normal and that is absolutely optimal on this. But if you are so inclined in the gaming section of the OSD you can select Overdrive Extreme and this just gives obvious overshoot. You'll be able to see this in the video very clearly. It's really quite ugly. It does get rid of a lot of the sort of smeary trailing as I was talking about but it replaces it with this nasty overshoot. 
So, and it gives everything a very over-sharpened look. It's really quite ugly and unnatural. Off. That just gives horrible smeary trailing everywhere. Might may not be clear in the video, but to the eye, it's really like you're drunk or something trying to play the game. Normal, much better balance. Stick with that, in my opinion. To wrap up then, the X35 is a member of the Acer Predator gaming monitor lineup, and it has the usual Predator look to it. Kind of gamer-esque in the way that it has quite sharp edges, but it doesn't have any bright colourful elements really. It does have some colourful LEDs on the back which you can turn on, but you can only really admire them from the rear of the monitor anyway, so they're not really of much practical use for users like me who have their monitor against a wall. Speaking of having the monitor against the wall, the stand depth is quite significant, so if you don't have a very deep desk, you might find that the monitor is fairly close to your face, and that's fine for the most part. Um, I mean, I had the monitor a little bit closer to my face than I would like. I would perhaps naturally sit around 80 centimeters from a monitor like this, but that's closer to 70 centimeters. But it does provide a really nice immersive experience. The curve is something which is exaggerated in videos and pictures of the monitor, but it's something which is really quite nice and natural in my opinion, and it's something which many users readily adapt to. I know from communicating with them that that is the case. The resolution as well, 3440 by 1440 plus the 21 by 9 aspect ratio, I really like this. It gives a good amount of desktop real estate, a nice pixel density similar to a 27 inch WQHD, that's 2560 by 1440 model with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, but it basically has more information either side of the screen. And that gives you a nice extra field of view by default when you're gaming, and unlike increasing the field of view with the in-game settings on a monitor with a narrower aspect ratio, it doesn't give you a kind of weird fisheye effect or look distorted or strangely zoomed out. It looks perfectly natural, but just with extra information at the sides. Now I realise I didn't really go through this when I was gaming, I didn't really mention this, although I did show you various games, so you can kind of see for yourself. But there is an article on the website which gives some comparisons between games running in 16x9 and 21x9 to give you an idea of how things look in comparison. In terms of the contrast performance, really a key strength of this monitor. It has a good contrast ratio, just the static contrast without the local dimming feature enabled was around 3,500 to 1. It certainly was a VA panel in that respect. Had a little bit of VA glow, especially towards the bottom of the screen. Not an extreme amount though. And has a bit of black crush, again about as low as I've seen on a VA model. So overall, gave a nice atmosphere to games. And if you enabled the SDR variable backlight feature, which allows the 512 dimming zones of the monitor to come to life and do their thing, it really did enhance the overall contrast, and I really enjoyed this. There was a bit of an issue on the desktop in terms of noticing halo effects every now and then, and especially when there were sort of large areas of flat shade, with brighter shades moving against darker shades in particular. But when I was gaming and when I was watching movie content, it wasn't an issue to me, I didn't really notice it much at all. In terms of colour reproduction, the monitor has a colour gamut extending quite comfortably beyond sRGB. It's around 90% DCI-P3, and this is a target for HDR, which the monitor does indeed support and support very well. So the color performance in both SDR and HDR, there were certain characteristics to the VA panel to be aware of. There were some shifts in saturation and gamma. So shades did lose a bit of saturation towards the edges of the screen in the bottom, but this was about as slight as I've seen from a VA model, especially one of this kind of size. So the image did actually appear vibrant overall um, and maintained a good richness throughout the screen. And I think most users would look at this monitor and look at content on this monitor and would describe it as vibrant. They would not describe it as washed out or anything like that. It was also quite nicely set up. It was easy to change things in the OSD to give a very nice look to the image so that I didn't need to apply any ICC profiles or anything like that. I mean, if colors are very important to you and you're wanting to use it for color critical work, be aware of those weaknesses I've talked about. I wouldn't generally recommend VA panels for that kind of thing, but if you do need to do that, 
then use an ICC profile made with your own colour emitter. HDR was really probably the most exciting feature about this monitor, something I most enjoyed using on this monitor. It really does a very nice job in HDR. It has the 512 dimming zones, it's a natively strong contrast VA panel, has an appropriate colour gamut for HDR, so it really ticked a lot of boxes. Really nice Vesta Display HDR 1000 experience, very good atmosphere, and it really ramped up the sort of experience I found with the local dimming under SDR, which was good anyway. Um, it, it really ramped up the intensity, how dynamic the experience was, gave some really nice, very bright elements, some nice atmospheric dark elements. The nuanced shade variety was very nice as well, with the 10 bit precision and the enhanced tone mapping capabilities under HDR. The colour gamut was also put to appropriate use, so that curtailed some of the saturation, the extra saturation under SDR, but the game developers were still able to put vibrant elements where they wanted them. So a very nice experience overall in HDR. In terms of criticisms of HDR, well, the main one would be you've got 512 dimming zones, whereas you've got many millions of pixels on the monitor. So naturally you do get some areas where there's a lot of bright and dark content crossing over and occupying just a single dimming zone. And that dimming zone has to compromise for the level of light and dark. So some of the dark content, for example, would be brighter than it should be, whereas surrounding dark content, which is just predominantly dark without the brighter elements as well, will be darker, and that gives you your kind of halo effect. But in general, that wasn't an obvious issue, and it wasn't something which detracted from the overall atmosphere in HDR, so this was really the nicest HDR experience I've had on a monitor overall. The responsiveness of the monitor, something of a mixed bag really, but mainly positive comments to say about that, especially given the panel type, I felt that the pixel responsiveness was quite decent. It was one of the faster VA models really, in terms of its pixel responsiveness. There were some weaknesses, but I don't think they were particularly pronounced weaknesses for the panel type. Input lag was nice and low as well, the 200Hz refresh rate worked nicely and it was put to pretty good use overall with the pixel responses doing a decent job, most of them fast enough for a good experience there. Plus support for NVIDIA G-Sync that worked very nicely, did its thing to get rid of tearing and stuttering. So overall this monitor ticks a lot of boxes for a really enjoyable gaming experience and it's probably one of if not the most enjoyable gaming experiences I've had using this monitor. I didn't feel it dragged down my performance in games or anything like that. I felt I was competitive enough. I'm not a highly competitive gamer, but I do like to do quite well. And I felt this monitor let me do that. I also felt that it really delivered very nice image quality in the process. It does have a price tag to match that though. It really isn't a cheap monitor. And I could sit here and sort of try and justify the price, but I'm not gonna do that. It's really something you'll have to weigh up for yourself. I mean, what does that money mean to you? Are you prepared to spend that much money on a monitor? At the time of the review, this monitor is over $2,000. I think it's $2,500. So it's um, certainly not a cheap product, but I do feel it does some things to justify that cost. And I also feel that that cost will probably reduce in time. I mean, it's fair to say it will reduce in time and that'll be a good thing. It'll make it a bit more accessible to a wider pool of users. So really very enjoyable monitor if you can afford it. So that's really all there is to the Acer X35. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.